site as a reference point now and stuff. And there's an amount of people that start off bands and say, you know, like the first song we ever played was a Buzzcock song. Um, all builds to all these myths, you know. There's the promises. There's the promises. There's the promises. There's the promises. Now, money, we've always been a band that said we're not in it for the money, but now this year we've said every opportunity I said, I want loads of dust, just because people don't expect it from us. Because if everything that we've ever done in the past, is, you can tell that if we'd have wanted to make loads of money, we'd have done a certain thing. Really, we, we're just terrible names and titles, lyrics being, um, I don't know, what's the use of language I suppose, titles, really bad at it, really, and like some of the other ones, the uh, Witch Doctors of Zimbabwe, <laughs> I couldn't really imagine the alternative, the alternative. What, it could be the Witch Doctors of Zimbabwe, oh, New Order, what do you want? <laughs> uh, I think it'll be New Order, thank you. I think the birthday party was more of a kind of uh, uh, almost a conceptual sort of statement. It was very much a kind of package um, and a kind of package of aggression and violence. And that's what I mean. And the bad seeds are far more kind of um, far more concerned with um, exploring musical avenues. I don't think you should view your music as a reaction against something. I just think your music should. Well, I think my music just. Uh, exists in a vacuum really you know I don't think right I'm going to show I'm going to uh, I don't have that kind of pioneer spirit that they, we perhaps had when we started off with postcard records and independent where we thought we're going to infiltrate the charts because I think that's very naive I think I've become a little bit slightly negative about the music industry whereas perhaps five years ago entering it I felt very idealistic that lots of things could be changed and everything could be, lots of people could be erased from the whole thing. And it isn't necessarily true, really, I find. So I've become a little bit uh, skeptical, even more so than usual. <laughs> Respect, respect is what makes it worthwhile. It's like the, the sense of achievement when you make what you consider to be a great record. You know, you're, you're obviously you're going to get people that say the, the record you know, is rubbish, but it's like when, when, when you look at your own record and you feel that I couldn't have made that any better, nobody's going to better that. That's a brilliant feeling. It's a brilliant feeling to make a record that you, that you yourself feel is, is you know, as close to perfect as you get. It's good to know that there's nobody better than you. An incident that was really, um, that people all knew about was like when Iggy Pop sang with us. And when I was 16 listening to like a Stooges album, if you told me that Iggy Pop was going to sing with us, I would have, you know, just laughed. I mean, it was an impossibility. I'd say I think Blast First has changed music to a certain degree in that the bands that we've, we've talked about are bands that have actually had an influence on the shape of music. Um, maybe in the sort of more left field or avant-garde sort of area, but nonetheless an, uh, an influence. Come here and do as you're told. Ah! Releasing records, it's, it's quite a vulnerable thing. No matter how good you feel the records are, you're laying yourself on the line to an extent. Yeah, it, it, it can hurt. It's a sad thing that there's bound to be some people who, uh, well, 
like, oh, that band's on a major now, so they can't be a good band and they won't even listen anymore. Um, I think people like that will be in a very, very small minority. It's you. You're very silly. Yeah. Oh, well, that's fine. I don't care anymore. Nobody's twisting your heart. I'd say just follow your heart, because anybody can do it. I mean, it's you can still... The music business is it's still... Like one, I mean, there's so much bullshit spoken about it, but you can still, if you really believe in it, you can make it work, you know. And it's like so many people would say, you know, I wouldn't, I wouldn't put you through what I've been through, but I would put Andy through what I've been through. I think it's like, it's like there's something really satisfying about like spotting a group, supporting somebody like how I picked up the house of love at the marquee, supporting the primitives, and it ends up like they're going to end up one of the biggest bands in the world. There, there is definite ambition in what we in what we're doing. The ambition is not the normal ambition of just becoming millionaires and just, you know, Wembley Arena or Wembley Stadium, here we come. The ambition is that we want to be extremely successful, we want to be a really popular band, but we also want to do it on our, on our own terms. Yeah, to a certain extent, we've been a flavour of the month for the last year type thing, but, uh, you know, we've basically been doing the same music for seven years, so uh, it, it's uh, we haven't changed to to um, to become fashionable or, or part of some movement or something. We are not in the music industry to manufacture pop music like so many acts in top 40, top 10 today. They are just manufactured <coughs> pop idols, stars. We don't want that. We we compete with our favorite records that we have at home. It's fun, it's like a game, competing with Led Zeppelin and the Beatles, and that's what we do, it's just completely for fun, because we're fans of rock music, and that's why we make records, because we're fans, and we just want to, like, join in on the fun, you know? We might not have had a party atmosphere going outside in the club or the venue that we've been playing at, but... Inside our record, Ed's, we've always had a little party atmosphere going on in there. We've probably had more fun than some of the, some of the crowd. <laughs> special qualities to be in a band, but you have to have special qualities to be in a, a band, uh, kind of, without wishing to sound too big but at the kind of level we're working at, you know, you do have to have certain disciplines that you need to stick to and things, but you don't, you don't have to be talented or anything like that.
was also a comment on the way music was made in the 80s, comment on things like video, comment on the kind of commercialization. Uh, Mark Knopfler actually got the idea for that. He was in, a, he was in a, a New York electrical appliance store buying a fridge or something. And uh, there was a big bank of TVs on one wall, all of which had MTV on with uh, you know, some group playing. And there were a bunch of uh, horny-handed sons of toil hanging around whose job was to deliver microwave ovens and fridges, watching some, rather, some person of rather dubious sexuality you know, glancing around on the TV and making these remarks about, you know, look at that faggot, that's the way you do it, or whatever. And Knopfler just dived behind a bridge and wrote down what they, you know, what they said, more or less word for word. And that was the song. I became the first rock, creditable rock and roll black singer. The image fit right with the, with, with the credibility, I think, as rock singer. You know, rock people usually are in jeans and leathers and, and uh, strange hair. And nobody is dressed very classy in suits and haircuts. And I think I was right there with the image. I think I fit, the image fit right with all of the... To say that there isn't a soul in this room who does not owe you their thanks and uh, to steal a line from one of your songs, um, whether you like it or not, he was the brother that I never had. <laughs> Collins is, is the um, uncontested hardest working man um, in show business, somebody who seems to have reacted to the range of opportunities that opened up to him in the 80s with incredible appetite. He seems to be somebody who's just not interested in enjoying the fruits of whatever he's earned, which must be thinking something considerable by now. He's just interested in working. This is the man who played at both ends of Live Aid, you know, took Concord across halfway through. and. Uh, when, when he wants to produce somebody, which he does uh, very frequently nowadays, they find that they can't find a time for him to produce your album for about three and a half years because he's got a Phil Collins album, a Genesis album, a film to make, a soundtrack to do, other production work to do. His life has to be blocked out in sort of two-year uh, two chunks. I tend to have more time off than people think, you know. I think since my first marriage broke up. The results of that was um, with Simon and Jolie both living in Canada. I speak to them every week. I see them as much as I can. They come over every summer and things like that. And I kind of, I feel very close to them. It's not like they've grown up without me. But that's probably made me, my attitude's changed a little bit towards work. I mean, I, when my marriage broke up originally, it was 1978, when we did a huge Genesis tour. I mean, three American tours, two European tours, and Japan. And uh, I could easily have said, no, guys, this is my marriage is suffering. But I didn't. I said, the band's got to come first. You know, we've got to do the band. Can't you understand? We've got to do the band. Whereas, no, I wouldn't do that anymore. So you just learn by mistakes, and costly mistakes, but you just learn by them. take things a bit too seriously and a bit too much to heart. If people um, said bad things about us or portrayed us in the wrong light or we didn't agree with something, someone that we're not so single-minded, so obsessed with ourselves <laughs> and what we want to do. Um, you tend to, as you become more mature, for want of a better description, you tend to take advice a bit better. You still make your own decision at the end of the day, but we don't feel bad doing it anymore. So I think, if anything, we're just a bit more relaxed, a bit more open-minded to what we can do or what we should do now. Final Cannibals was one of the strangest success stories of 
of uh, Warfare Wars 189, and that they did, they spent three years or something doing uh, this, the dreadfully titled The Raw and the Cook, and uh, they really didn't seem to give a stuff about it when they were promoting it. And then it went to America, and it just went enormous. And it was number one for I think it's, uh, eight weeks in the summer, and it's not the number one album. Now we're not difficult to interview at all, I don't think. But we're not not really uh, we're not really interested in being poppy, poppy, no. sloppy, sloppy, just crappy, crappy. You know, that's all we can do really is pass over the information. And we still can't see any point in living down here either, because we still we still all live in Manchester. I'll keep For me, so absolute rock bottom. Uh, saw me within three weeks of completely stopping ever playing music again and opening uh, a restaurant. And it's seen it slowly in Europe go from 57 people in Sheffield was the Chris Rea Mark II first gig on the tour, and then there was 36 people in Bristol the night after that. And those figures always stay with me, I always remember that. Uh, and from there it's slowly gone on, you know. And it's been a happy time for me. And the perverted fear of violence chokes the smile on every face. Common sense is ringing out the bell. Well, we played in Dublin like this. They wouldn't let us play in London, they wouldn't let us play in Madrid, they wouldn't let us play in New York, but the LAPD let us play here for you. Stadium bands, technology and rock dinosaurs.